could be really important. So we're going to cover a topic now, which is going to be of great significance in undergirding algebraic data types. But it's also of great significance in our work applying category theory to health modeling. And, um, and, and more broadly, applying category theory in many areas. This notion of minimal categories, particularly symmetrically many categories. And we're not going to do full justice to this, but I, I need to get you to the point where you understand the fact that HASP is a, it's a monoidal category. In fact, there's multiple monoidal structures. Mm -hmm. um, so not only is it Cartesian closed, it has products, but it also has co-products. Uh, co there's products and exponential. Okay. Um, so here we're going to uh, go and we will be covering here in a whirlwind way, in a kind of loose way, um, product categories uh, and monoidal categories. I said Markov categories, right? Not, not actually covering that. It's product and monoidal categories. I'd love to cover Markov categories, but that's uh, that would be uh, not not true advertising. Product categories and uh, monoidal categories. There we go. Markov categories are ultra cool, but they're outside of the Okay, um, so you remember product, right? It's on the, the board here. We have this universal property, which you reminded me of earlier, right? Um, uh, so uh, given any other object in the category, which has C, which has morphisms to A, F here, and morphism to B, G, right? There is guaranteed to be a unique morphism from that other object, that pretender, that contender, C, to the product. It can be factorized by it. any other way of getting an A and a B. I could express in terms of the product, and with the product being the most parsimonious, the most succinct, the most, uh, you know, the, the most uh, um, distilled um, or exemplar information, keeping information on A and B. I can always express it. Um, so you demonstrated awareness of this before, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, but I do want to remind you a little bit of some of the properties of this, and just to motivate some of this notion of monoidal structure. So you tell me, um, we can take the product of, of any of in a in a category where all objects have products that's Cartesian. We can take the product of of any two objects, right, and have a product of them that's a Cartesian product. Hmm? And, and the product of any two objects exists. So we can combine. We can think of it as combining any two objects with a product operation. Yeah. Given any two a b, we can combine them, sort of like with numbers. We might add them, multiply them, um, or what have you. What is the product of any object with the terminal object? Do you remember this? So if we have uh, some object A and, and we consider the terminal object one, what's the product of those two? Do you remember? A. Ah, it's, yeah, so it's strictly, it, it, I mean, more precisely, it's isomorphic to A, but, um, but essentially it is the same information as A. And the factorization goes like this, right? That if you have A cross one, you have a unique map from one to one. Remember these, these mappings down here are projection maps, right? So the one from A cross one to one is unique. Well, why is that unique? Why, is it, why does it have to be unique if it's a map from A cross one, from A cross one to one? What's that? Uh, yeah, so, but this this property of it being unique is, it's a, terminal. it's a terminal object. You have only one morphism into it from any other object. And is A cross one an object? Yes, it is, it's an object. So it has any map, only one map. And the map from A to A 
um, is uh, needs to be the ID map. Um, and that, if, if you have, and then you have F going from C to A and C to A cross one, both, both have a map F from uh, C to A, okay? Um, I'm ignoring this a, bit, a little bit. It, it should be actually a pair. It, it'll be a pairing of, of F and, and a map uh, down to one as well. Um, so just sort of uh, a, uh, it'll just give the only map uh, into one. So it's guaranteed to be isomorphic to A, zero, et cetera. Okay. Um, this this map. Um, and and so we could think of it as like, what does this remind you of? If you combine A with the terminal object, you get A back. What is what does that thing remind you of? Identity. It's like an identity in a in a monoid, right? Um, now it turns out co-products give us similar things. If we, what's the thing which, if we take the co-product with any other object, gives that other object back or something isomorphic to it? What is it? It's the, is it the terminal object? Initial. It's the initial object, right? And, it, and you know, we can, it, it probably is good to think about these in set just to make sure our intuitions tell us something, right? So what would it mean for, to have A cross one in set? What would it mean to have, let's say, int cross the singleton type here? What, what would that mean? What, why do I say that this is isomorphic to int? Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll think of this as, I'm going to make it even easier to think about by making this bool. Why do I say it's for any type, but I'm putting down bool here, that basically it's the same information? Why, why is it the same information? Yeah, the, there's only there's no leeway. Like this has no degrees of freedom, right? So all this is is like tagging something unnecessary on, right? It's it's just tagging on something that's that's not adding any information, right? Um, so all we have is true, comma this and false, comma this. It's in one to one correspondence. With with bull over here, right? And the same thing if this was int, right? If this were int. Um, and we can write a function that given a bool creates one of these by just pairing it with a singleton and, and another one that goes back. It's isomorphic. Do you see that? Um, we could, you know, we could have we go either way. And for co-product, you said terminal object and here, do you remember what co-product uh, on a programming basis corresponds to? It's having, so a product is having A and B. What is uh, sort of both together? What is co-product? It's having, yeah, uh, it's a yes, we could say, or, but it's having either A or B, right? You, you either have A or you have B, right? Um, so having either A or the empty, the, the, the um, uh, initial object, what would that correspond to? Do you either have A or you have a thing that's akin to the empty set, right? Why do I say that's the same as having an A? Essentially. Yeah, so it doesn't really have any yeah and, yeah, and you can't instantiate it, right? Like it's if you could have a you either of A or a bool, how many possibilities do you have compared to just having an A? Well, if you have A or a bool, right? Um, you get of all the possibilities of A and then two more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be times if our product took for times because you could get all the values of A and, and the first value here and then all the values of A and the second value. But with co-product, A plus, say, 0 and 1 
if you get all the values of A, that's a possibility. Um, right? Uh, so you either have one of those, all the values of A, or you have on the right hand side zero, or you have on the right hand side one. So it's all these plus two. Do you see that? Mm. Um, so if you have if you have a plus zero, how many possibilities do we have? Eight. Just a, right? Because you can't have any of this. This is like empty set. You can't possibly give one of these, right? There's no possibilities there. It doesn't add any extra possibilities. There's no extra degrees of freedom at it, right? Um, okay. Now, this should also remind you of something. What? So what is zero acting like from the perspective of co-product? It's acting like what? An initial object or, or a unit, right? Unit, as, as, as Larissa said. It is the initial object here, but it's acting like unit from the perspective of a what? Begins with M. Monoid, right? It's acting like a unit. And remember a unit and a monoid, you combine it with the monoidal operation with anything else, and what do you get back? So in a monoid, if we have an element A from a monoid and we combine it with a monoidal operation, maybe it's plus, maybe it's times, maybe it's you know pair, maybe it's concatenate, we combine it with the monoidal unit, what do we get back? A combined with the monoidal unit gives us A. And so it is up to isomorphism. I say up to isomorphism because you could say, well, you know, like here, uh, taking the product with a single thing, it, it's not exactly bool, but it's isomorphic. It's the same information. No, yeah. do, you, do you understand that? It's not exactly the same. If you give this as a type, if you pass this in where it expects a bool and you give it a pair of a bool and a Singleton, it's going to complain, combine it. It's not exactly the same, but it's the same information. It's isomorphic. Okay. Um, so it turns out that if we have products in co and or co-products in a category, it's equipped with a monoidal structure. Okay. And um they're not alone. Like there's other things that will also exhibit monoidal structures sometimes. And it's desirable. To be able to generalize this, to express kind of monoidal structure in general. So to be able to map a pair of objects in some source category into uh, a, a category that represents sort of a combination of them with a some, some combination. Maybe this is a plus b. Maybe it's a uh, categorical product with b. Maybe it's a in some other operation. We call it tensor. It's just kind of a, a generic, and it's nothing to do with tensors in high dimensional physics or, you know, in, in sort of linear algebra, but it's it's just the name for a generic operation. Okay. Um, uh, and here's the thing we want, it turns out we want to do this well. We want a functor that maps any A and B, and, and B, any pair of them into this. That's option. That's what the job of the functor is going to be the structure preserving mapping into A cross B. And it turns out that the, the sort of cleanest way to do this by far is not to define a new type of functor, it's to define a product category. So I need to I need to show you this. I wish I didn't, but um, it's not bad. It's really useful. It's very common. Um, it's just not sort of it's one more step in the in thinking it through. So given two categories, we can always construct the product category. Okay, whoa. Okay, so now we're kind of going up a level. We have any category C and D, there's a thing called product category. Okay. And and what's that product category? Well, the objects are pairs of objects, one from C, one from D. Hmm? So we could take a product category of um, pre orders of um, the things that divide 30, remember those integers that divide 30? And we could take the product of that category and the category of natural numbers with less than or equal to, or what have you. Or take the 
take the product with the schema category for soft flow. Um, it's basically the objects or pairs of objects from each category. And a morphism is uh, only exists in the product category if there's morphisms between the corresponding objects in the in the uh, category C and D. So let me let me give you a sense of what this is. So I'm going to show you here not C cross D in general, but C cross C, just to give you a sense. So here's imagine the system. Okay, so we have objects and we have morphisms. What does C cross C look like? Well, remember what did I say were the objects in a product category? What are they? They are products of objects in the source categories. Here at C and C. So they're all pairs like A, A. So A, A is here. Uh, there's A with B, right? Um, and A, B is the whole thing. Okay, uh, right top, oh yeah, A, A cross B, et cetera. And then there are morphisms here. Do you see there's some morphisms? And every morphism there is a pair of morphisms here. Sorry? Yeah, so like uh, this, you'll notice there's a morphism from A to B, right? And so if you consider A, A, and it's mapped to B, B, the morphisms F cross F go to that, right? It's just this morphism cross with itself because. The first gives the mapping from the first element, A to, A to B, and the second one, the second one, right? Um, so why does A cross C go to B cross B with F cross G? Can anyone say? First of all, where does A cross C come from? Where, where does that come from? It's a product category produced by crossing C with C. So where does A cross C come from? Yeah, A, 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 A paired with C. Do you see that? You see that? Where does B come from? B cross B value. Where does that come from? B cross B. Right. right. Okay. And why is it F cross G? What? What? Why is the first one F? Because that's a morphism from what to what? A to B. So this guy here to this guy here. And where does G come from? C to B, right? From the second one. Whoa, sorry. Um, second one here to the second one here. C to B. Do you see that? Okay. Um, so the idea here is you have morphisms if you if in the original category here C, or if it's C and D, C. In the category you have F and G, the D, and the other one you have G. Um, so if you have maps in those original categories, say from X to A and from Y to B, for every one of those maps, you have a map from XY to XB. And this is readily determined, but just put aside, put aside product categories for a moment. If you have a product XY, and you have another product, XB, I would claim that you can create this construction. If XY maps to X, that uh, has projections to X and Y, that's what product is, right? Projection to X and Y. And if A cross B has projections to A and B, that's what a product is. But if more than that, if you have a morphism from X to A and another morphism from Y to B, you can always, have you always have a unique morphism from x y to x b uh, a cross from a cross y to a cross b? Why is that? Why do you have a unique morphism? Why is that guaranteed? Um, because I do just do the whole. That's that's true. Is there's a lifting of f and g here? They're lifted to be h, but but what, well, it turns out. There's a universal property. What universal property guarantees H exists? A unique H. Uh, it's already, uh, yes. So the universal property of the product says, given A cross B, any what? Uh, so, so given A cross B, where we have projections to A and to B, 
given that, any other, any other what? Object. Oh, well, yeah, any other object with these per se projections to A cross B has what? Unique, uh, unique factorization, yeah, unique morphism H. And so what I'm saying is if you have X cross Y and you have additionally F going from X to A, hmm, that's going to give you a way to get A from X cross Y. And if you have a morphism from Y to B, that's going to give you a way to get into B. And that would guarantee, if you have this, you're guaranteed to have a morphism here. So what I'm saying is, as Tony said, there's kind of, if you have an F and G here, um, from an X to an A, from Y to B, you automatically get a map from an X cross Y to an A cross B. Mm -hmm. And so here in this, in this product category, we have a morphism guaranteed to exist uniquely for each combination of morphisms over here. You see that? Each combination of morphisms like F cross G, we're, we're guaranteed to have exactly one morphism from A cross C to B cross B. Do you see that? Okay, okay. Um, okay, so the final thing I need to tell you about here before we get into algebraic data types is bifunctors, okay? So, so bifunctors operate on product categories, okay? So the idea is that a bifunctor's job in life is to take pairs of objects and it's a structure preserving mapping into another category with pairs of objects, okay? So it takes pairs of objects, CD, and pairs and, and it lifts them and maps them to and maps them to a single object C cross D in the destination category. So a bifunctor takes a pair. It says pair in this product category, and it maps it to a single object. So it kind of takes, oh, um, one of these guys, let's say C cross D, and it maps it to C tensor D. That's, that's, that's just a fancy way to say where it maps it to by the function. Do you see that? So it maps this guy over, over to that. But a function job of life is not just to map objects. What else does it do? Maps morphisms. And so each of these morphisms here, like, our favorite morphism, F cross G, that's this one here, in case you can remember, I don't know why it's not labeled here, um, from A, A cross C to B cross C. That is also mapped over here. I guess I, I don't show exactly which one it goes to, but it's it's also mapped over to a morphism in this target category in a structure preserving way. Okay, so so bifunctor does this. Um, and uh, and basically, these are light functors, but they're structure preserving mappers operating on pairs of objects. Okay, and in Haskell, we have a thing called bimap that that does this. So, product has a bimap. It takes pairs of objects and it can map it over to a particular object that's their product. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with this? And and uh, maps it can lift morphisms f and g to a mapping between products, just like you said. Bifunctor honors composition. It's structure preserving, and I'm not gonna go into this, but it, it preserves structure. If you, you can either compose in the source category and then map, or you can map and then compose. Uh, so it, it, it honors structure, it maps identities to identities. And, okay, so all this gets us to a mineral effect. What's a mineral category? Well, it's a bifunctor with some really nice properties. Um, so there's a minoidal product, um, and and that's implemented with a bifunctor maps objects, pairs of objects uh, in category C to uh, to category C. For example, maybe it maps um, uh, a pair of sets to the the product of those sets. There's a monoidal unit, which is basically an object, some object in C, uh, which we call I. Okay. Um, it can be defined as a functor from category one into C, which just picks an object. Um, do you see why that says a functor from a one object category into C is just picking an object in C? Do you see why that is? Okay. Okay. Um, and it has some associativity properties and some unitality. So basically, whoop. 
Unitality, anyone want to guess what that's about from the word unit? Sorry? Um, yeah, yeah, you've got the right idea. So if you combine the unit, you tensor it with any other object, you get that other object back. And if you tensor any object with that unit, you get that same object back either direction, the right identity or the left identity. And associativity basically says it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. But here's the thing. Often these things are only up to isomorphism. So like if we say one comma two comma three, um, it's not exactly the same as, not precisely the same as one comma two comma three, but it's the same information. It's up to isomorphism. It's just up to forgetting where the parentheses are. Yeah, going going quick over it, and it, and it maps um, it matches some really nice coherence condition. We basically said what the rules are. Okay, now we're poised, and unfortunately we're out of time. So we may have to. I think we should probably just do it on Thursday. Um, we're poised to be able to cover out the things. Okay, so the key thing here is that Hask has two notable monoidal structures. It is product. Why do I say that's a monoidal structure here? What are the objects in Hask? What are they? They are what? Hask. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if we confine our attention for the moment to objects, what would it mean to take the product of a int and a bool? What would that mean? So, so the objects are types, so we'll Taking the product, just think of it, you know, think of taking the product um, before we took the product as, as a construction. Here we're using a functor to map it to the product, back mapping a pair or bool, and, and, or sorry, of, of int and bool, and we're going to map them to another object. What is that object going to be? And ask all objects are what? Hubs. So the job of the monoidal category or the monoidal um, <clears throat> this uh, uh, monoidal structure is to map these pairs inch and bool to another type. So what would be the type for product? What would be the type with an inch and bool and hask? What do you think it would be? Yes, inch comma bool. What would a co-product be? So by the way, there's like a comma here. That's what this is. It's a pair of, it's a product of it. What would a co-product be? Well, you may not be as familiar with Haskell, but in both Haskell and in Scala, we have this concept either. It's one or another. So it's either an int or a bool, but not both. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's something that you know, could either be given to you as a um, as an integer uh, or as a double, for example. Um, it's not a great example. We'll see some much more interesting. So these are types. Okay. Um, uh, and the monoidal structures operate on types. But more than that, they're based on functors. So what else can they do besides mapping types to types, besides mapping them? Double or an int and a bool to an object. What else can they do? They can map morphisms. They can lift morphisms. And we just saw what that means to lift morphisms here. We we just we just saw given a morphism from X to A and, and one from Y to B, I can lift them to map an X cross Y to an X cross B. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm lifting it to operate on the mapping with the functor of the object. We can, just like we lift things that map from doubles to bools about whether it's negative or not onto a list and get back a list, uh, onto a list of double and we get back a list of bool. Here, we can lift two functions to map um, from a double to a, uh, uh, to a bool and an int to a bool, so something that's an either a uh, double or int, and and we get back uh, an either bool or bool. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so so we have these two structures here. And it turns out this gives us, together with exponentials, it gives us tremendous power. Incredible power. Um, do you want me to go on for half an hour and finish this, or do you want to do it on Thursday? What's your preference? Give it more time. You want to do it today? Okay, let's let's do it. Let's do it. This is the most fun thing. I, I tell you, this is this is going to be uh, the most wonderful, wonderfully useful, but also um, beautiful and and.